The guard looked Bartholomew Kais up and down for a moment and then frowned. I'm sorry, Master Kais, but the princess is not seeing visitors at this time. She is, of course, in despair over the arrest of her mother. Of course, the young composer said, nodding and looking appropriately sympathetic. But I'm not just visiting, you see. Her Highness requested my instruction. We are to practice her singing. The princess already has a vocal maestro, the gruff woman replied, raising an eyebrow. I'm sure he knows that, Odette, said a kind voice echoing down the hall that connected the residence to the palace. The two turned to see Susanna, one of Princess Annette's handmaids, walking towards them. What the good composer means to say is that Annette requested his work for their practice. The young woman smiled at the guard and gave Bartholomew a conspirational wink. From his satchel, Bartholomew produced a sealed tube. If you will be so kind as to deliver these sheets of music, my dear Susanna, he said with a smile and a genteel nod. The guard took the tube from him, but as it changed hands, something with a little weight shifted inside the tube. What's this then? The guard asked, jostling it next to her ear. Certainly not a small statue of a bird that the princess is fond of, Bartholomew thought. The quill and ink I used to pen the music, in case she or the maestro wished to make any changes. I always deliver some with a new composition. Susanna gently took the case from the suspicious guard. Oh, would you stop, Odette? It's just some music, she chided playfully. I'll see to it that milady gets these, she added with a hand on Bartholomew's arm. I'm sure she'll be eager to see the contents. In the wake of the arrest of Queen Marianne for high treason, none was more heartbroken than our daughter, Princess Annette. Suitors throughout the city-state of Tempest sought to ease Annette's sorrow by courting her and bringing some joy to her life. You are one of these suitors, trying to get your love letter to the princess. Unfortunately, she has locked herself into the palace, so you must rely on intermediaries to carry your message. During the game, you hold just one secret card in your hand. This is who is currently holding your letter. Make sure the person closest to the princess holds your letter at the end of the day, so it reaches her first. Love Letter is a beautifully tiny card game for 2-4 to four players by Seiji Kanai. With a deck made up of just 16 cards, you'll be amazed at just how much depth there is in this game once you really get your teeth into it. But first, let's get to grips with the basics. Here's how to play Love Letter. Shuffle a deck of 16 cards. Deal one card to each player face down. Place the tokens of affection to the side. Remove one card from the deck face down and place it to the side. In a two player game you remove three cards and place them face up to the side. Although I've never really thought this made sense myself so I've always placed them face down. Place the remaining cards in the middle of the table for all to reach. This is the draw deck. Deal one reference card to each player. The reference cards will show you each of the cards that are available in the game. The number on the left of the character's name indicates the value of each card, the princess being the highest valued at 8 and the guards being the lowest at 1. The number in the brackets to the right of the character's name shows you how many of each of this card is in the game, so there's only one princess but there are 5 guards. The reference card also tells you each card's ability when played but in shorthand form. More info on each card's ability can be seen on the card itself or in the rulebook. And just like that, you're ready to start playing. The starting player of rule in this game is the last person who went on a date goes first. If this doesn't appeal to you, of course, you can come up with your own way of choosing a starting player. The app Choisy is a good choice, for example. The first player draws a second card into their hand. They must now choose one to keep and one to discard. The card they discard will have their power activated. You'll be able to read each card's power on the card itself or there's also a shorthand version on the reference card each player has. The game will last over several rounds, with the aim of each round being to either be the last player remaining by knocking out the other players, or to have the highest value card left in your hand at the end of the round. The round ends when there are no more cards in the draw deck in the middle of the table. Now you shuffle all the cards back together. Don't forget about any you place to the side at the beginning, and set up a new round. 
If there is ever a draw for highest value card at the end of a round, the person whose discarded cards adds up to a higher value wins. Anytime a card is discarded, it will lay face up in front of the player who played it, so card counting becomes easier as the play moves along and there's less cards available. You will also become familiar with the most common card combination plays. For example, if someone plays a countess, it is most likely that the card left in their hand is either a prince, a king or a princess. If someone plays a king, it's very likely that they just handed their princess over to someone else because most people won't play a king unless a princess forces them to. I have found from personal experience that when I play a guard to guess someone's hand, guessing the baron or the prince have the highest success rate due to the cards having two of each card available and people holding onto them for reasons that you'll familiarize yourself once you get to know the game yourself. I'm going to explain one card ability that I feel every player gets confused with when they first get to know the game, and that is the Baron. The Baron is valued at three, and there are two of them in the game. His ability states that you must compare your hand with another player's and the lowest value card is out. When you play the Baron, you don't compare the Baron with somebody else's hand, you compare what's left in your hand with someone else. So if I play this Baron, I will show someone the card remaining in my hand. In this case, the Countess, and if their card is valued at lower than my Countess is 7, they're knocked out for this round. If you play the Baron and it turns out you and the player you have chosen have the same value card, for example you both reveal a Prince, nothing happens and play continues to the next player. The game ends when one player has a certain number of affection tokens from the princess. As she's now read so many of your letters, she's become enamoured by you. The number of tokens you need to win are dependent on how many players are playing. In a two player game you'll need seven, in a three player game you'll need five tokens, and if there are four playing you'll just need four. And that's it! It's an incredibly simple game, you already know how to play, and it took no time at all. The next thing is getting good at it. In all its simplicity, there is a certain level of bluffing, reading other people and their cards, and also a certain amount of luck, depending on the cards that you draw. There are also plenty of expansions available for Love Letter, all slight variants on this basic set of rules. Some of my personal favourites include The Hobbit one, Archer, and Premium Edition, which allows you to play with up to eight players, and adding loads of new characters, giving the game an extra level of depth. If you enjoyed this video, there are plenty more available for you to check out, some of which should be popping up on the screen right about now. You can of course also head over to dicebreaker.com for brilliantly written articles. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.